Are you ready to help me with my next video, Dabs? No. It's not an unpaid internship, though. I will pay you in milk bones. Still not interested? Good help is hard to find these days. Hey everyone, it's Anna, and I'm back again with another vintage cookbook. This time, get ready for Dishes Men Like. <laughs> Dishes Men Like, this, this cookbook was published in 1952. If you saw my last video, you'll know that 1952 was just an excellent year for cookbooks like this one. <laughs> So I'd just like to start by sharing a couple of very wise passages with you. If you have a husband who likes to cook, pamper him, encourage him. You are lucky indeed, even though you find yourself only a fetch and carry handmaiden, while his genius glows. But men are wise. Not one in a thousand really wants to take over the job. They usually have a few specialties to produce on occasion and leave the rest of the cooking to us. So what do we do? It goes without saying that most women choose dishes men like. And men have quite definite likes and dislikes about food. For instance, they like Lee and Perrins. Guess who published the cookbook? Lee and Perrins. <laughs> That was just page two, folks. Reading through this cookbook, I gotta say, a lot of the recipes seem like something I would eat. There's not a lot of things that are unusual. I just counted a very minimal number of aspics and jelly molds, so that's promising. Also, it seems like there are a lot of casseroles in here. I grew up in Ohio, I live in Ohio, I know my way around a casserole. You don't scare me, speedy green noodles deluxe. Not afraid of you, tuna chips casserole. There are a few interesting little finds in here. Particularly enjoyed this little section on pick-me-ups. I'll just read that for you now. Note for husbands, Lee and Perrins, if taken on the morning after, will immediately set you right for a good day's work. Here are two suggestions. Add two teaspoons Liam Perrins to a raw egg, stir and swallow. Or alternatively, you can add two teaspoons Lee and Perrins to an eight ounce glass of tomato juice or sauerkraut juice and drink contents as quickly as possible. It's as though they're saying, husbands, we understand that you have to go on drunken benders every now and again. It's fine, Lee and Perrins has got your back. Do these remedies actually work? I'm not about to try it myself, so if you have, just let me know. Again, not a ton of unusual things to cook here. I was very afraid that they would have a section on desserts, but they did not, and for that I am truly thankful. One particular section that did catch my eye, however, is the eggs and cheese section. On this page, there are several different variations on Welsh rarebit or rabbit. They actually use both terms in here. I did a little research and both are acceptable. I think today, just because the name is interesting, I'm going to make Rink Tum Diddy Rabbit. I did a little bit of snooping around on Google and thought, hey, look at this funny name. It's, it's hilarious. Come to find out it is a centuries old dish that actually exists. Basically what it is, if you've had Welsh rarebit, you know that it's kind of like a beer cheese sauce over served commonly over toast. This one is just a variation of that. It's more of a tomatoey cheese sauce that is also served over crackers or toast. I haven't eaten lunch yet, so I'm pretty excited about this one. It sounds tasty. Let's get to cooking. I've gathered up all of my ingredients. I wanted to talk a little bit about double boilers. This recipe is made over a double boiler. Some of you might already know what this is, but there may be a few who don't. So what a double boiler is, it's a pan with a few inches of water simmering in it with another pan over it. You can buy double boilers that are already fit together, so a pan that fits inside of this pan. I don't happen to have one of those. I don't use one very often, so a mixing bowl over simmering water will also work. I noticed that in a lot of these 1950s cookbooks, double boilers are very common. I'm not exactly sure why. I was trying to find out. My guess has something to do with 
temperature regulation on older range tops. Could just be speculation here, but the reason we use a double boiler is for things that have eggs in them or cheese or melting chocolate. That's a great use. It's for cooking foods that you don't want to expose to high heat right away or very quickly. This cooking method is very gentle. It helps regulate the temperature really well. Things like hollandaise sauce. If you're making a lot of hollandaise sauce, you don't want to scramble your eggs. So that means you don't want to expose those eggs to high heat very quickly. So now our ingredients. I've gathered everything here. You need eight ounces of grated cheese, a half a teaspoon of salt right here, a can of condensed cream of tomato soup, three tablespoons of water, and then one tablespoon of Lee and Perrins. This recipe is a bit of a shortcut. Some of the other recipes that I looked at seem to have like diced tomatoes or tomato juice and a lot of other ingredients. This one seems fairly simple. This recipe came out during an era when more convenience foods like canned soups, boxed shelf stable items, things like that, more of those types of foods were becoming readily available. So I can see why maybe this shortcut version would have been popular. First off, I better grate this cheese. There's two cups of cheese in this recipe. I'm just using mild cheddar. It didn't indicate anything in particular from a lot of the recipes that I looked at. It seems like that is an acceptable cheese. I did find one recipe that had processed sort of American cheese in it. Maybe I'll try that again too someday, but I just didn't have any. It's raining cheese. If you hear Dottie snoring in the background of any of these videos, just know that she turns 15 next month. So she's a little bit of an old lady and she gets to do whatever she wants. So I typically work around her. She, she has earned the right. It's arm day. We are working with a mountain of cheese. Cheese is grated and now it's time to move over to the stove. I have my pan of water simmering on the stove. I'll put my mixing bowl on the top and then we'll start to melt the cheese. So in goes the cheese. I've never made a cheese sauce quite like this. So typically I would start off with like a butter flour roux and get that going and then add my milk and cheese. But this is melt the cheese, add the tomato soup and the rest of the item. So interested to see how this goes. It started melting pretty immediately. This is beautiful. That's exactly what I want is a big bowl of melted cheese. Hangers on. Mm. Get, get back in there with your friends. Wow, you really don't want to go. <laughs> this is looking kind of gooey. I feel like once I start adding liquids, a whisk might be a better choice. Oh, heck, look at this. Massive melted cheese. Wow. I do kind of want to eat this with a spoon. Don't tell anybody. It says next. And the salt, the tomato soup, and the water. And the, the lean parents. I mean, this is pretty much as melted as it's gonna get, I think. Bring this over. It's like a big gob. Big gob. I'm gonna add the tomato soup. I got this really cool, super skinny spatula at one of my favorite kitchen stores. Shout out to Butler Pantry in Saugatuck, Michigan. Does a great job of scraping little skinny spaces. We add the salt and we've got the water. This is where I'm really nervous. I feel like this water might make things seize up. And then Lee and Perrins. And I think I'm switching to a whisk just to see. <laughs> I'm losing hope. It's really gummy. I really want this to work. Come on can do it. You're supposed to stir constantly until thick and bubbly. It's already thick, it's just thick and stringy. <laughs> this is not promising. <laughs> I'm also wondering, similar to my last video, if maybe the formulation of tomato soup was different or they used a different cheese. It just it looks a little bit like egg drop tomato soup. It's grainy. Maybe this is what it was supposed to look like. I'm gonna just keep going. Maybe suddenly it'll all come together. <laughs> Looks like it might be happening. We're gonna go back in with a whisk. I just 
want this to be like smoother. It doesn't say how long to cook this. It just says until thick and bubbly. Well, it's not really bubbly. It was already kind of thick to begin with. I'm gonna get a tasting spoon. Okay, it's looking a little smoother. I think I just need to be patient. Ooh, got some on my glove. Good flavor, like excellent flavor, but uh, texture wise, leave something to be desired. <laughs> Tomato soup queso. <laughs> I think this is about as smooth as we're gonna get though. I'm gonna start making a couple pieces of toast and just let this go for a little bit longer. We got toast toasting. This maybe is getting smoother. I mean, unless I'm just projecting on this dish, <laughs> projecting what I actually want to happen. It looks nice. Maybe it's time to grab another tasting spoon. Mmm, very salty. <laughs> Again, the texture is a little grainy. I can't help but wonder if I had added milk instead of water, if this would have gone a little bit better. Just gonna beat the heck out of it, I guess. This recipe does check a lot of boxes for me. Cheese, check. Tomato soup, I like tomato soup. Toast, love toast, and no anchovy paste. I did find a couple recipes in the book that, that contained anchovy paste. I didn't want to make those. I'm not sure I could take another anchovy paste recipe. Oh, there it is. I'm giving it one final whisk before I serve it. So I made myself some nice sourdough toast right there. It just says serve over toast or crackers. A lot of the other recipes I saw said to broil this after you put the cheese on. This didn't say anything about that. We're going with how it is. I feel like if I had some parsley, it would be a little bit more of a beautiful presentation. <laughs> Let's give it a taste. It's really hot. A little bit more of that tomatoey goodness. Mmm. It's really salty. I would probably omit the salt completely if you're gonna use Lee and Perrin's, which I think has anchovies in it now that I think about it. <laughs> Try another bite. It's very tasty. Again, the texture is just kind of grainy. I would probably make this again and try to tweak it by either using milk instead of water and possibly using a processed cheese instead of a regular cheddar cheese. That just seems to be what's causing the graininess here. Hey, did you guys notice that I just keep saying Lee and Perrins instead of the name of the actual sauce? Yeah, I'm avoiding it. <laughs> I always feel like I say it incorrectly, or I think I'm saying it correctly, and then I hear someone else say it another way, and I doubt myself. Here we go. Looked it up. We're gonna find out how it's actually pronounced. I hope. Worcestershire. 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 I think I got it. This was another fun project. I'm really enjoying making these recipes. It kind of gives me an excuse to hold on to all of these vintage cookbooks and maybe get some more. If you have dishes men like, let me know. Let me know if you've cooked any of the recipes out of this book. Maybe there's a family favorite that I'm not aware of and I would love to try it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye. Let's pretend I'm mixing things. Do, 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 talking to the camera.